This is Unsilo, brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. Welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with Paul Ormerod, who is a visiting professor at the Department of Computer Science at University of College London, also the founder of Volterra Partners, I think it's an economic consulting group, and the author of many books. There's one called Against the Grain, Insights from an Economic Contrarian, which is a compilation of articles that you'd written for a periodical in London. Also, this one from a couple years back, Why Most Things Fail, Evolution, Extinction, and Economics. This one, Positive Linking, How Networks Are Revolutionizing Your World. Also, Butterfly Economics and the Death of Economics. Welcome, Paul. Yes. So, look, the death of economics, I think that might have been a bit premature. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember, because I wrote it, um, this was in the early 90s. I mean, economics has changed a lot in a positive, well, some negative ways, but in, in some very positive ways since then. It's become much more empirical at the micro level. Uh, but if you went back 30 years, it was, you know, purely highly theoretical and journal articles were full of papers on a rational economic person. And of course, then, you know, free market ideology was then beginning to, if you like, take over the world. So it was a critique both of mainstream theory and of, you know, free market policy. Now, I could have called it a theoretical and empirical critique of general equilibrium theory, but I don't think it would have sold as many as it did. <laughs> no, so uh, that was, I mean, that was a, it wasn't my idea, it was the publishers, but it was just a brilliant, a brilliant title, which, you know, so the book was, was very, very successful. Well, I think it's still in print. In all of these books of yours, they are critiques of a particular type of economics, right? The yeah. neoclassical, yeah. general equilibrium, arrow de Bru approach to economics. And you advocate the incorporation of complex adaptive systems, of biology, physics, you know, network theory. In other words, ideas from other disciplines, you advocate incorporating them. And so, you know, on the one hand, this is something that is not new, right? So you reference Hayek, yeah. you reference uh, Schumpeter, right? There have been folks who have been advocating these alternative views of economics for a long time. And I think it, to some extent, as you just acknowledged, the profession has attempted to expand its methodological toolbox. Before we, we can dig into some of the critiques, which I think are still valid, but to what extent do you think that economics has evolved over the last 30, 40 years? And if it has, has it done so because it's gone back to these insights of Hayek and Schumpeter, or is it is it just doing it by e expanding? Is it more like the Ptolemaic curly cues that are just being added to the old model? I think if I could make a, a more general point, I, mean, I think the mainstream economics, it's not an empty box. It does contain you know powerful insights. And so the idea that agents or people uh, respond to incentives, you know, is a very powerful idea. And in particular, I think it's often caricatured that people think incentive, it must mean price. But in fact, it could be a whole range of factors that people respond to. And if the incentive set changes, then behaviour changes. I mean, the example I like to give is, say, even the most fervent critic of mainstream economics, if you're driving along and you, if you, whatever reason, exceeding the speed limit, and you see a speed camera approaching, you will slow down because the probability of being caught and being fined has increased. And that's an obvious example. So it's not a completely empty box. I think that's an important point to make. But thinking in the last 30 or 40 years, I would say in one way it's made very big strides forward, and in another, it's actually gone backwards in a serious way. I think the way he's gone forward is in looking at the behaviour of the individual, if you like, microeconomics, the low level, where it's become much more empirical. And, it, and let you say, it's really expanding and building on the, the core model. It's not altering the core model, but it's taking you know, many other factors into account. And economists, like you say, they are willing to consider new ideas. For example, there's been some recent Nobel Prizes given for work on, say, randomised control trials as a, as a methodology. So it doesn't stand still, and they are willing to incorporate ideas. 
But where I would say it's gone seriously backwards is actually in macroeconomics, where there are models with the incredible name dynamic stochastic general equilibrium models, which are in widespread use in central banks and uh, institutions like the IMF. They're not the only ones, but that is essentially become the dominant theme in academic macroeconomics in the last 30 years. And rather paradoxically, at a time when their micro colleagues are trying to construct a much more realistic and identifiable model of the individual, the task of these models has been to import into macroeconomics almost a caricature of the rational agent. So these are based on I mean, they are, they've changed since the financial crisis, but until then, there was only one person in the entire economy, the so-called representative agent. Now, we should think about it. One of the big problems in the financial crisis was a fact, was a problem of debt, you know, that, you know, people were loaded with debt, and that was a major issue. But if there's only one person in the world, then, you know, it's a bit hard to hold debt for, or, you know, borrow from yourself. And so they were just keep incapable. Now, since then, they've tried to expand it. But I think increasingly there, many economists are, you know, like bypassing them, saying, well, you know, that's a research project which is coming to a dead end. But it's been the dominant one for, for 30 or 40 years. So, yes, at one level, economics portrays a richer and more realistic portrait of how people behave, more grounded empirically. But at the macro level, it's really gone backwards. Well, I forget who it was that you quoted in, in one of your books where you said that microeconomics is about how economists can be wrong in the particular. Macro is all about how they can be wrong in, in general. It's P.J. O'Rourke, I mean, it's a brilliant insight. Right. And I guess it's easy for us to critique economics, but then when we see folks who fail to acknowledge economics, that's when we need to rush to its defense. And I think you, you have some interesting commentary, I think, on the recent policies around the coronavirus, where it seems as if economists were sidelined throughout this entire conversation. I've heard one economist from Stanford say that this was probably the single biggest failure of the economics profession in our lifetime, where economists oh. stepped back and left the conversation to the immunologists and the epidemiologists. Yeah, I agree very much with that, because I was actively involved in discussions in the UK on this. I'd make actually an important distinction between like immunologists and virologists who actually are scientists who know something about, you know, viruses. But initially, certainly here in the UK, it was dominated by the epidemiologists. Now, I've, I've, had, I've published articles years ago using the approach, the basic approach of epidemiology to explain things like spread of crime or evolution of family structures. And I've actually, I bought a book, it's a rather splendid book, it's about 600 pages long. It's the textbook on mathematical biology, which was first published in 1990. Now, the point here is, I think, is that certainly then, it was actually rather difficult to do the maths around the epidemiological models, because you, you, know, you had to you know, set up and solve differential equations. But now, I mean, computer software has made so much tremendous strides that it's possible to, you know, set these models up, you know, really very, very easily, very, very easily. And I mean, economists can use anybody with a, a reasonable mathematics background, including economists, because let's face it, on the spectrum of, say, physicists and pure mathematicians, I mean, we're just sort of infants, you know, but we can understand that sort of maths. And the key thing you need to know there is, you know, will behaviour change in response to a pandemic? And that's something that the epidemiologists have little understanding. So here, and I think it's probably been the same in the US, that the pure epidemiologists with you know, quite simple mathematical models have persistently been far too pessimistic about the number of cases and the number of deaths because people do learn in a, in a pandemic, they voluntarily reduce the level of social interaction. Right, so the R-naught is not 
the, I remember in the early days of the pandemic, people were treating this as if it were a constant. No, but it evolves even, even in the models themselves. Yeah. It does evolve. Exactly. And how infectious it is, that's a question for the virologist. That's a, a you know pure scientific question. But it's a function of proximity with others, the frequency of oh, interaction yes, with sorry. others. Yeah. It's a product of social behavior, yeah, just, right? Yeah, but just yes, but in, indeed. So, but once you've got once you've got a scientific fix from the people who understand viruses about if you like its propensity to spread, then it really is like you say, it's much more a social phenomenon. You know, how much are people interacting, etc., and people can make their own decisions. Because if we go back, uh, there's another, I'll come on to the more substantive point in a minute. But if we go back, say, to the 14th century, when the Black Death swept through Europe, and that was by, I mean, that killed. I mean, anybody, I mean, virtually anybody you got that died, right? The survival rate was, you know, not even a tenth of 1%. It was a more special. Yeah, that's a real pandemic. Oh, yeah, that's it, it was for real. And it, and it seems to have killed right. at least half the population of Europe. Mm -hmm. Uh, but then, of course, people altered their behaviour immediately. You know, lords and barons locked themselves away in their castles. Towns closed their gates. And they desperately tried to reduce social interaction, as they obviously would do. And, you know, some were successful, others weren't. But I agree with you. I think, well, one, I think, incredibly, economists seem to have been rather intimidated by because they weren't familiar with them, because most economists don't read outside their discipline. But if you did do that, then you'd realize that the you know, the models were easy enough for economists to understand. But there were some people, this is going back to the spring and summer 2020, who used a tool, you know, very familiar to economists, looking at the cost-benefit analysis and say, yes, you know, there is, in terms of the spread of a potentially lethal virus, there will be some deaths. Uh, we can do different. We might get different numbers from different forecasts, but there will be some deaths, and there has. I mean, all health services around the world do this. There has to be some some way of valuing a human life. Otherwise, you can't decide how to allocate you know, scarce resources of drugs. How you decide you know what treatments to carry out. I know a lot of non-economists find this you know rather distasteful, but it is. You know, really, you know, pretty essential to do in general. And so you could, you could get a cost. You could then say, OK, what's the cost of allowing the pandemic to sweep through undisturbed? And then we can look at the benefits of bringing in lockdowns. But then what are the costs? It's not just a loss of output. I mean, the costs are now, I'm sure this is the case in America as well, and certainly in Europe, the costs are, you know, say cancer sufferers can't get treated. Mm -hmm. The waiting lists for men, for say, so for hip operations have increased dramatically. Now that's not life threatening, but the people I've known and I'm sure you you've known them who've needed hip operations, I mean the quality of their life is extremely low. You know, and there's a value on that. There's a value on the loss of output. There's a value on loss of employment. There's a value on not being able to get treated for other diseases. And so when the economists, there were several you know, very interesting studies produced using standard approaches. And every single one showed that lockdowns were not worth having. But, but you're right, incredibly, the economics profession as a whole didn't get behind these economies. Certainly in the UK, they were quite, you know, quite prestigious ones. It, you know, it wasn't just a you know, graduate student producing. These were well-established, you know, well-known economists, certainly in the UK and some had an international reputation. And they didn't really support them. And I think that was, it was a big mistake by the economics profession because there's a tool which economists, I mean, the, the critiques of it, but the idea that you carry out this sort of analysis is a standard part of economics. And it would have been very illuminating for policy. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised because we always say that economists are imperialists and they want to dominate every discussion and they seem to have gotten a little gunshot. No, but they opted out. It was incredible. They, they opted out, obviously. I mean, economists do dominate uh, public policy discourse. You know, whether it's at the national or state government or whether it's in international bodies, everything is filtered through the lens of economics. And on this one, they said, oh, well, you know, we pass, we'll step back. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it was uh, a measure, like I guess I think initially, because most of them didn't know anything about 
the models which the epidemiologists were using. And now that they have done it, it's now starting to appear. They did start to rally and produce things. And they've now said that some of the leading, say, uh, or leading world journals, academic journals are all American. They are producing papers on this and starting to take it seriously. But they did just step back. Whereas I think now they're, they're more engaged. But economics is such a powerful framework that it's capable of incorporating these other disciplines. I think of it as having the capacity to be a clearinghouse for different disciplines, if understood broadly enough. And I remember one time I was asked to teach biology and I found it to be a relatively seamless transition. Right? I mean, you use a lot of the same models. You just have to cross out some terms and replace some other terms. The one difference, however, and I think you point this out in the book, particularly when we're thinking about evolutionary phenomenon, is that in nature, right, you have what we might think of as parametric optimization, yeah. right, where the organism is acting as if the world is going to be the same as it yeah. was yesterday, whereas humans are capable of this strategic optimization yes. where we can assess the world and make predictions about the world and then adapt our behavior accordingly. Do economists, when they do incorporate models from biology, do they fail to acknowledge the, the differences or you know? Well, I think it says to give it a historical context, the a chap Alfred Marshall, who was in fact a, an extremely good mathematician, he read maths as, a, as an undergraduate, but he set up the Cambridge England Economics Faculty about 1900. And he was very astute and thoughtful. His work was mainly in English rather than maths. But he was very clear that he thought that economics was fundamentally a biological topic, that that's what we should be trying to work towards. But of course, when he was writing, there were simply very few tools. I mean, the standard models of epidemiology weren't invented until the very basic ones until 1930. So many people have said these things, and but the tools haven't been available. But I think there is one of the psychological blocks to economists using them or incorporating these is that a key assumption of standard economic theory is that people's tastes and preferences are fixed and that they exercise their choice independently of others. That's part of the core model of economics. Now, they know it's obviously not literally true, is that your tastes and preferences when you're five years old are not quite the same as they are when they're 50. So they know it's not completely true, but to say, is it you know, more true than wrong to say, can we assume that tastes and preferences um, are fixed? And I think sometimes it's a valid assumption. Say if you've got a well-established consumer market, people have had a chance to learn about the different alternatives and if it's a mature consumer market, you could say that's not a bad approximation. But in, in more rapidly moving ones of certainly in innovative technology, it's not true. But also your choices are not affected by what other people do. Now, we know that economics has always had models which cope with, say, fashion markets and herding markets. But they are a sort of, you know, they're here. They're sort of put to one side. And so, well, okay, if you really want to know about that, there is a box that we can lift a tool out of, but this is our main box. Whereas with epidemiology, of course, like you say, social interaction and what happens to your behaviour, consequences for you of other people's behaviour is absolutely fundamental. And I think that's why they've not really paid much attention to them because the core view of economics is that you act like Robinson Crusoe, and the core assumption of epidemiology is, no, you mingle with the crowd. So there are really these fundamental, if you like, world differences in worldview. Thus, hey, economists, you know, can, they do have incorporated, uh, you can find papers on, uh, you know, herding behaviour, and this sort of thing. Uh, but I do think there's a psychological block there. Right, and certainly in finance, we've seen a surge in interest in contagion and financial instability you know, bank runs, bank panics. And, oh yes, I mean that, there was a you know a, a flurry of modelling about that after the, the the financial crisis, and so. But I think the the frustrating thing about that was that. I mean, I'm not saying I predicted the financial crisis, but a small number of economists were sending out warning signs and saying there could be 
exactly the sort of contagion that happened. And so, you know, economists have done, you know, distinguished work subsequently in understanding the central banks, of course, were desperate to know about this. So they have done it, but it was like after the event. So when the next war comes, we'll be able to fight the previous one, if you see what I mean, you know, in, in that in that sense. But they could have done it before. You know, it was there. They didn't do anything in the early 2010s, which they couldn't have done 10 years previously. But it just didn't occur to them that this was, you know, a possibility. No sense of urgency. Well, there was no sense of urgency. And, I mean, to be honest, I mean, well, in fact, economics explains quite a lot of what went on. Because given they're talking about the idea of incentives. Now, I'm just thinking about financial markets and the financial crisis. Then the standard model which was used for evaluating risks of portfolios, to the value of risk, it's a very smart model. But it assumed, if you like, that the risks of a really extreme event were you know, incredibly, incredibly tiny. Whereas, in fact, some leading statistical physicists, start, I got, I was, this is what made me interested in the physics side, in the late 1990s got interested in looking at this. And they showed beyond scientific doubt, absolutely beyond doubt, that this wasn't true, that the chance of a rare event was, in fact, very, very small, but it was much bigger than in the economic risk models, which were used, were being pervaded by... Economists and of course the financial crisis, you know, made the point. I mean, prices dropped precipitously. There was a, I remember somebody from Goldman Sachs saying there'd been two Six Sigma events in succession. Which I mean, if the model had been true, that shouldn't really have occurred since the beginning of the universe. You know. Well, if the distribution was normal, and there was tons of empirical evidence that the distributions were not normal. Yeah. But it seems like modelers just stuck to the normality assumption because what, just for model inconvenience? Well, I don't think that's true because even by then, you know, we, if you got numerical solutions, you could incorporate these other factors. In fact, I mean, I did actually hire somebody who just finished a PhD in statistical physics at Cambridge to try and build a package on this in, you know, in, in, in fact, at, at the dot-com crisis. And he did it, I mean, with something called VisiCalc, it's incredibly primitive. <laughs> Uh, it may still exist, but it should be a museum piece now. Um, oh, I and think it's gone. almost got funding for it, but then the dot-com boom collapsed. So I, I forgot about it, but I didn't know about that. No, I think it was simply a matter of incentives, that everything seemed to be fine. People were making tons of money. It suited the politicians because they were, you know, getting the benefits of a booming financial sector and a booming economy. So nobody had an incentive to, if you like, overturn a model which wasn't wrong most of the time. The model which was being used was a very good approximation to reality. Uh, the only problem was when you really needed it, it wasn't. And that's what they found out in the financial crisis. So I think there was a, if you like, a strong incentive for everybody, for the bankers, the traders, the IMF, the central banks, uh, politicians all had an incentive to pretend it was true and to ignore, at like least, the overwhelming scientific evidence. So, economics itself, I think, explains that. Well, economists are always looking at incentives. And I, I'm an economist, but I guess for some reason, I'm always inclined to, to think that these kinds of mistakes are due to failures of method and failures of, you know, scientific approach. And so if we were to look at, say, the coronavirus crisis right now and the response to the coronavirus crisis, if, if we were to put that economics lens on and look at incentives, and I think at the moment right now, most of us are in inclined to think that mistakes that were made due to failures of imagination or failures of scientific understanding. But there, I guess if we wanted to be cynics, what would be the incentive story that would explain the, the missteps of our recent coronavirus response? Well, that's a tricky question because I think we have to be reasonable and say, look, suddenly this new virus appears and it's very uncertain. The initial data, I remember the initial data that came out from Wuhan suggested that the death rate was between 3 and 4% if you got infected. Now, that's terrifying. I mean, that's in the UK, that's like, you know, 2 million deaths. In America, it's 10 or 12 million deaths. And so you think, oh, what are we going to do? 
And so you've no idea. And so you can see why people panicked and say, brought in extreme lockdowns. So you could see that. And the, the one country, actually, the one country, I'm not sure how well known this is in the US, but Sweden didn't. There were very mild restrictions, but they essentially relied on the Swedes themselves responding to incentives. And so Sweden has never been closed down. You've always been free to go into a bar, order a pint, go to a restaurant. There have been some minor restrictions. But the Swedes themselves, if you like, produced endogenously a response which reduced their social interaction. And although they have had deaths, certainly on a per capita basis, it's been less than the UK, less than France, less than Italy, less than Spain, less than the US. And they've done that without any lockdowns whatsoever. And in case anybody watching is saying, well, you know, the, the population density in Sweden is very small. Uh, that's actually not true. It's a highly urbanised society. Almost all Swedes live in the south and virtually nobody lives in the vast expanse, which goes beyond the Arctic Circle. So they did that, but I can see why it was difficult for politicians. He, we had massive uncertainty, if you like. And so people were just were just really, really terrified about that. Although actually it was very interesting, just this is rather an aside, but I was actually at the University of Sydney in the February 2020 when the news started to come out at the Complex Systems Institute there, actually run by a very interesting chap, Mikhail Propokemko. He's Ukrainian and he, and he was born in the Soviet Union when the Soviet Union existed. And he was a very bright mathematician. And so he had to start off doing his military service for Soviet military intelligence. But anyway, he was very interested in this. And we were looking at, he showed me on the, this is relevant to the, the origins of the virus. The first Wikipedia page, was it was called the Wuhan virus. And there's a Wikipedia track on that. And he showed me, and there were like hundreds or thousands of edits of that page every day. And he said, you know, the Chinese are trying to control the narrative. And we were looking at the bar chart of the number of cases. And then we, we, we switched the machine and he, put, he brought it up. And the latest day was there. And we said, we both said, no, that can't be true. You know, it's, it's just not possible, you know, mathematically for that observation to be true. And as we were watching, the observation changed. Somebody had altered it. So, you know, well, the Chinese had an incentive there to, to, to try and pretend that it wasn't really their fault. I think in terms of why most things fail, I read a piece by an economic historian. This was like in the late 1990s, which looked at the largest hundred companies in the world in 1912 just before the First World War, and how many had failed, et cetera. And I just plotted around how many failed in each year. And I thought, this is, looks very interesting. It's a highly non-Gaussian distribution. But I'd also been interested, there were a couple of very interesting models, if you like, formalizing extinction models appeared in the 1990s. And they seemed very similar to me. And so that's when I got interested in saying, here's a clear parallel between the pattern of firm extinction and the pattern of biological species extinction. They look, from a statistical point of view, extremely similar, even though we got, you know, certainly from the species, it's a limited data set. Obviously, the firms uh, are not trying to fail. Like you say, they, they have the capacity to, to adapt. But nevertheless, it was, if you like to use a favourite phrase of economists, it was as if they really had no control over their environment because... The, their extinction pattern, and even these giant corporations looked very similar to that amongst biological species. And in fact, I remember being asked to read this as an undergraduate, and I couldn't make head or tail of it at the time. But there's a Chicago economist who wrote in 1950, it's all in words, it's an absolutely brilliant paper, and it was a purely theoretical one. And he was trying to deal with the idea that the critique of an you know, can firms actually, does it make sense to assume that firms start like profit maximize? And the classic defense was one from Milton Friedman, which said they do because otherwise they'd become bankrupt and they'd fail. And Olkin was absolutely brilliant, decades ahead of its time, he essentially said, that's all very well, but you do require your external environment to be rather slow moving compared, you take a decision and providing your external environment is, it doesn't have to be fixed, 
It just has to move less slowly than the impacts of your decisions. If that's the case, yes, that is true. But in fact, if the environment in which you're dealing evolves rapidly itself, then you can never learn. It's, it's, it becomes impossible to actually learn enough to actually optimize in any meaningful sense. And in fact, going back to what you were saying earlier, it's very interesting because there wasn't just the Olkin paper saying, look, in many situations in the real world, the idea that agents, whether it's firms or individuals, are optimizing doesn't really make any sense because their environment is changing so quickly that they can't get a hold of it. And of course, it was in that decade as well, a few years later, 1955, uh, that Herbert Simon produced his uh, paper on behavioral economics, in which he essentially said, well, the, basically, the assumption of, of, of economists that agents optimize you know, is just false in general, and we just need some better rules of behavior. Uh, which he got interested in. And, th and these are not like obscure economists. I think Olkin didn't get a Nobel Prize, but he's very distinguished. Simon did. And so all this stuff was there in the 1950s, which, I mean, for some reason, I can't remember. I, was, I remember reading them as an undergraduate and not been able to make any head or tail of them. But 30 years later, I thought, well, yeah, these are absolutely brilliant pieces. I'm glad I knew about them. But it was there in the economics literature to be exploited. And economists said, oh, thanks very much. No. Because, I mean, this is going back to, say, Simon's work, because he said agents don't optimise, they satisfy. Now, economists were very smart and actually neutralised that phrase, where Simon was saying you essentially adopt a rule of thumb, a simple rule of behaviour, which seems satisfactory, and you continue to use it until it doesn't, and then you find a different one. Whereas the economist said, oh, well, you make a satisfactory choice. You decide when you're searching amongst alternatives, you will stop when you find one, when you judge that the effort of further search won't be justified by the benefit of getting something closer to your ideal. And that's not what Simon meant at all, but economists were very smart, if you like, in neutralizing that thrust. But he was talking about a completely different way of behavior of a much more like heuristic behavior and finding a heuristic that worked until it didn't. And that was a simple guide to behavior. Because you see, the problem is, sorry to go on about this, the problem is, and this is, once you start to do that, then if you lose generality, or it's hard to retain generality. See, the great strength of economics is that it says agents react to incentive. And this is a general rule. You know, it applies in Britain today, it applies in California, it applied in India, I'm just making this up now, in the second century. It's true everywhere. And so once you've got that's a very powerful tool, but we're saying, well, actually, in this situation, people are using this rule, and in this situation, they're using another. So I can see why economists don't like the idea of having to find different rules in different contexts. Though the book that I wrote, Positive Linking, is using a model really from cultural evolution. Instead of saying agents gather up information on alternatives and compare them to their preference and make a choice which is close then, you know, subject to costs and price. This is saying, well, essentially, it's a copying one. So you, you actually choose the ones which were ones amongst the alternatives in proportion to how popular they are. And it's a very good for understanding fashion markets, for example. And Herbert Simon actually had a model of this, again, in a, in a separate paper in the same year, 1955. He discovered this, which then remained undiscovered for another 40 years in a formal mathematical sense. But also you have a bit of a random choice. So you say, if something's got 40% of the market, I'll just choose that with a probability of 0.4. But I've also got a small random choice. And that seems to be a very powerful model for understanding uh, markets, especially new markets where people haven't got information about products. Because from this model, you do get highly non-Gaussian distributions of outcomes. I mean, think, say, of, of internet, so, you know, the Google search page. I mean, it's well known that at least 90% of all click-throughs are on the top three things that come up. Now, that can't really be, it might be that they are the best. 
and it could be the algorithm selected them, or it could be that other people have chosen them, and they may not be the best, and you'll never know which the best is, because you Google a topic and it says approximately 2 million sites. You're not going to look through 2 million sites. You might go to the second page if you're determined enough. So I think we really need essentially two models, I would say. One is areas in which standard economics is a good approximation to reality. And this is one where it's relatively easy to understand the attributes of products and the differences between them. And an area where, if you like, people are in general choosing independently. You can allow some social influence, you can allow some difficulty of understanding the differences between products. But if you like, in that, if we do a little four box, here's how difficult it is to understand and here's independent choice. In that quadrant, standard economics is good. The rest of it is not. The rest is not necessarily just fashion markets, but anything which has important implications for the future. Think, for example, of a choice about pensions. Now, you'll never really know whether your choice is good until you come to, to draw your pension. Now, that's when you'll really find out. So different distinguishing between the different alternatives is actually a very hard problem. I mean, isn't this a function of the speed with which the environment is changing? So the optimal kind of decision rule is a function of how much learning you have to do from others, right? And presumably in an environment that's relatively stable, one can develop a, a fairly, you know, rigid rule, a fairly precise rule. But in a world where things are changing rapidly, you don't want to overfit your rule to the environment. And so you're going to want a more general rule, maybe a more heuristic based rule. And you're probably also going to want to learn a lot from others. One of the things that I found interesting in the book was how you talked the patterns of extinction, they're not constant, right? They vary. And there's a couple of reasons for this, one of which has to do with the speed of change in the external environment, right? So, you know, when a comet hits, this leads to a, an, an explosion, right, of, you know, creation of new species and destruction of old ones. And you talk about the Edwardian explosion in the early 20th century of these, you know, the creation of all... Aren't we kind of going through another one of comet strikes? And I don't mean the pandemic, and, but I mean sort of the digital transformation. Isn't this another period where old routines are simply incapable of morphing quickly enough to survive? Oh, no, I agree with that. And I think because obviously, despite some economists saying technology is not really improving, moving very quickly, it obviously is. It's obviously the internet makes the world really completely different and it connects the world much more. And the book I wrote on Positive Link, I wrote that nearly 10 years ago now. The world's just become even more interconnected and even more influenced by other people's decisions. And yeah, so it's going back to what Simon was writing about nearly 70 years ago now, saying you try and find a heuristic, a simple rule of thumb that will guide you. And so in a lot of markets, you might say, well, my uncle, for example, he seems to know about finance. I'll follow his advice on which pension scheme to choose or whatever. And you might choose different people for different things. Yeah, but we are moving to a world, you know, a lot of the world needs a simpler heuristic. But also going back to your saying about economists, the other thing about it's not just the fact that they're thinking that choices are, that, that preferences are relatively stable and that they're independent, but it is this idea that agents optimise is deeply ingrained. Well, actually, in many circumstances, it doesn't even make sense to talk about an optimal decision. So, for example, I discussed at some length in Why Most Things Fail was a game of chess because the World Chess Championship is taking place now. I'm not, I, I like to follow it, that's all. It's just interesting. But you say, OK, we're starting a game. What is the optimal move for white? And nobody knows. Nobody knows. And chess is a very simple game. It's got a, a very limited number of rules that an intelligent person can learn in an afternoon. Business is um, a lot more complicated. Yeah, but even then, chess, I think all positions with seven pieces are now solved by modern computers, but there are 32. So unless somebody makes some absolutely stupendous advance in quantum computing, we're never going to get there. And you say business is much harder because the rules of the chess pieces is fixed, whereas the rules of your competitors are not. They will alter, or a new competitor may come in. You know, a, a competitor... Uh, like a piece coming in which hasn't existed before, suddenly enters a board. 
So it's much harder. But even in chess, in most situations, the optimal move is not known. And this, it turns out that this is essentially how the top grandmasters play. Of course, they try and look ahead, be foolish not to, but often they will say, they will make a judgment based on their experience and the patterns they've had before as to, does this seem a reasonable move? Is it a satisfactory move in Herb Simon's sense? It avoids obvious loss. And from my experience of patterns, come across position in the past, in this sort of position, this sort of move tends to work. And that's how they seem to think most of the time. I think you, you reference Hayek's critique of planning and the impossibility of coherent planning in the presence of limited information. <laughs> but some people might argue, hey, with what we've got now in terms of compute capabilities, right, with big data, heck, I mean, if if Jeff Bezos was in, in charge of the Soviet Union, they might have given us a run for their money, right? Are those critiques still valid? The Or have we oh, figured well, there out? Is, actually, there is a very good novel called Red Plenty, which is set in the Soviet Union, I think in the late 50s, early 60s, when they were actually precisely trying to do this. There was, I think, is it Kantorovich? I think he actually got the Nobel Prize in economics. And I think there was a group in the Soviet Union who thought that computing power would enable them to solve all the problems and make their economy work properly. I think it's true. I mean, big data, one of the problems I think is the way it's often used is that it's, it might be very good at fitting a particular circumstances, but it, it may not generalize very well. That's always a problem with any form of statistical analysis. So I say, I mean, I've been there. I'm attached to the computer science department at UCL, but that because of one of the things I've been interested in for a long time is, you know, econometrics and statistics. So that's just a, a natural extension. But you've always got to be careful about are your algorithms capable of generalization? And then you've got the, all the different incentive structures to, you know, to take into account. So I think we're a very long way away from being able to plan in any way optimally. It will be much harder. Uh, than solving chess, I think. So we've got a long way to go on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that as our ability to compute gets better, the complexity of the phenomenon we're trying to understand is increasing at an equal clip, if maybe even a faster clip. And, you know, one of the things, Volterra is that your company is called Volterra. And of course, Volterra was a famous kind of ecologist. He came up with the kind of predator prey model. And I think when you're talking about why firms fail, you talk about these exogenous shocks as one instigator of yeah. failure epidemics. But but you also talk about how there's this endogenous failure, right, that's just baked into the system because of the interconnections of all the different players. And I was wondering if, if you could talk about that. There's this power law and this kind of iron law of failure that, that you cite, which is, is there a constant there? Or you mentioned that bigger companies tend oh. to survive longer. Certainly the Soviet Union, right? You know, with soft budget constraints, it was impossible to fail. The guilds in the middle ages, like they never failed. I mean, Schumpeter would probably argue that creative destruction is not a constant, but rather is a, is something of a, a variable that changes based on how we organize our world, right? Yeah, I'm just trying to think of, a, of one of the examples I use. Of going back to this database of the, the world's 100 largest companies in 1912. I remember them, one was in Russia. This is before the, this is Bryansk Engineering. And that became extinct because it was nationalized by the Bolsheviks and the shareholders were expropriated. People forget that Russia so had was, the second largest stock market in the world, I think, prior oh, to Oh, yeah, that. it was doing very well. So, yeah, get the ex exogenous shocks, but you get cascades of failure in the same way. And it's also, it is this point that it, it's very hard to anticipate what the re reactions of your competitors, will there be a new competitor? As we can see, so even very large firms fail. They go under. And we can see in the turnover of the one, say, the Dow Jones or even the S&P 500, there's a big turnover of these very large firms. And it doesn't mean if they drop out, they've failed, but they become much, much less important. And they've got every incentive to succeed. They've got huge amounts of resources. They've got a lot of data. They've got quantitative analysis. They've got qualitative people. They've got advertising agencies. And despite all this, they get things wrong, sometimes very substantially wrong. Because let's say the environment in which they're dealing is a very complex one, which is shifting all the time. 
and at some point you make a mistake and eventually you will go under if it's a big enough one. In a way, not in a mistake of saying it's something that which you could have known at the time, but if you like say, looking back, that might be the reason why that happened. It's very hard to anticipate it, what you ought to have done optimally. Because obviously in a, an optimal way, if everybody can optimise, why would anybody ever fail? If you're making the best possible decision all the time. But I wonder if the species analogy is really the right one, because you know when a species goes extinct, all the genes in that species, they disappear unless they have some cousin somewhere that, that has a similar gene. Yeah. But in the economy, when a firm goes bankrupt, right, all the people who work there, they go elsewhere. The, the optimal extinction cycle is probably, it's non-zero, right? Because we kind of want I, these I, things to uh, Yeah, no, I agree. It's not complete. But I was just looking, there, there are some very strong parallels with this, uh, the empirical evidence extinction patterns. That was why I was writing the book saying, how can this, because if you think about it, say business schools always eulogize success. And you can say, oh, this, this succeeded because of this, this succeeded because of this. Now, actually, as you've been a bit cynical on these things, often as soon as it's appeared in the Harvard Business Review as a success story, it collapses. But that's not completely true. But they don't recognize the fact that the overwhelming factor about firms, about business, is that eventually the units fail. That's the key characteristic. And you know, longevity, it's not for many. They don't live all that long. Yeah. And I guess maybe, as you say, we overly praise longevity. Maybe longevity should not be the goal. Maybe firm preservation should not be the goal of managers necessarily, right? Why should we preserve for the sake of preserving? It's maybe the goal would be to have a higher extinction rate early in the process so we don't go down all these dead ends necessarily. Yes. I mean, when you come to like that set technological norms, when a new technology appears, the one which comes to dominate might not be the one which is actually the best one. Now, I know there's a debate around this, but the quirky typewriter, some people say, no, it didn't happen like that. The one thing I'm thinking about, this is going back say, to the 80s when video recorders first came in. I remember I got one. I think, yes, it was a Betamax. And it was great. It was much better than the competitor. But for some reason, the competitor just got an edge. He started to sell a bit more. And that became self-reinforcing. That more people had heard of it and said, oh, that's fine. So their friends bought it. And as it became pulling ahead, people stopped stocking stuff for the Betamax, etc. Even though it actually was a superior product, it was eclipsed by its rival. And that was just by getting an early lead in the process and then through a process of copying, you can see then how the suppliers reacted as demand for the one was falling away, gave it more space, shelf space, gave it more advertising. I think the point here, it has to function. I mean, this situation, a video recording brand that didn't work wouldn't actually get many sales. So it has to have a certain basic level of capability. But beyond that, there's no guarantee that the best will clean up the market. In, in situations where people don't know how to evaluate. It's a new product, it's a new market. You don't know, you've not got enough experience to do it. And so a copying heuristic is actually a very sensible one. Okay, so last question. You've been writing these columns for quite some time, and I think you're trying to broaden people's economic literacy. Do you think that economics is something that everybody needs to understand? Well, yes, I think it is. I mean, I think, like I say early on, it's not an empty box. And there are a few concepts from economics which, if people understood them, I think the understanding of public policy and the conduct of public policy would be much better. You know, the idea, say, of opportunity cost, it's something which people some often find great difficulty understanding. That's really quite a fundamental one, or even very elementary points. Like for economists, we think all the time of trade-offs. We know unless resources aren't infinite, so that in almost everything there's a trade-off involved. And for us, we think quite naturally that. But many people, even very intelligent people, don't necessarily see this and say they don't see. Going back to the the pandemic, there's a, there was a trade-off between saving lives and the economy saving other people's lives who didn't have coronavirus and might have cancer. There are trade-offs all the time. 
And that's a very, very powerful idea, which is second nature to economists, but which, as we can see, as the pandemic shown, is sometimes completely absent from public discourse. So I think there are a few very, very powerful insights from economics, which every citizen should really understand. They don't need to be able to prove existence in general equilibrium theory, but they just need to have a basic civic understanding of the insights of economics, which are powerful and which seem to be true in a scientific sense. Well, I'm not sure that we can educate everyone on economics, but we should probably start with journalists. I was part of a law school once that had a mission that was to teach judges about basic economics. And, and I'm wondering if, if we should probably have something similar for journalists, right? It's It seems like a basic understanding of economics is, is essential if you're going to more or less describe anything that's happening in the world. But oftentimes, journalists don't seem to be aware of some of these core principles. Oh, no, I'd agree. And I think also I'd say journalists actually, ironically, are often some of the biggest practitioners of copying. That once a story takes hold, then everybody's, you know, then people start to write about it, regardless of its intrinsic merit, and often making the same mistakes. In fact, I think it was Hayek called, he talked about, was it, was it secondhand purveyors of ideas? And he singled out journalists and said that particularly of not reflecting. But I think that's a way it has become harder for journalists, hasn't it, in, with the rise of 24-7 media. It's not the middle of the 19th century, and presumably if you're writing for the Times of London, you could take a day to compose your piece, and even if it was a day late, it didn't really matter. Maybe you've got to do something now, and so you don't get the chance to think about these things. But I agree, and so it comes back to this point that economics is not an empty ball. They are willing to take on new ideas, but I don't think they do it rapidly enough. There's an awful lot out there which would um, enrich economics and could be uh, fitted into um, the framework and, and would help to broaden it and make it even more powerful. Well, Paul, thank you so much for joining me. Again, lots of great books, Positive Linking, Death of Economics, Why Most Things Fail, and of course, your latest book, Against the Grain. And of course, you have a blog and journal pieces that you're publishing all the time. So just check out the website. I appreciate you joining me and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk again soon. Yeah, thanks very much for inviting me. It's very enjoyable, very interesting. Thanks very much. Thank you. This is Unsiloed brought to you by Alumni FM, connecting people through stories. 